All right. So our next talk um, <clears throat> is from Pravesh Kothari, who's talking about the sum of squares approach to disentangling Gaussian mixtures. Take it away. All right. Thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, are the slides visible? Everything good? OK, great. So um, yes, so uh, thanks to the organizers for you know organizing this fantastic workshop and inviting me to it. So I want to tell you about this recent line of work on using the sum of squares method to um, uh, cluster mixtures of Gaussians. And I'm actually going to focus mostly on uh, this uh, very recent uh, joint work with my student Anish Bakshi at CMU on um, clustering non-spherical mixtures. Uh, okay, so let's uh, begin. All right. So you know this is a this is a talk about an algorithmic problem. So let me describe that problem to you. So um, you know the input to this algorithm is going to be capital N points. These are IID samples from some d-dimensional mixture of K Gaussians. We're going to think of d, the dimension, as large in this talk. So we are interested in polynomial time algorithms in this parameter d. We're going to think of K as a constant. And actually, believe me, you know, for, for both mine and your psychological well-being, it's important to think of k as a constant because I'm going to show you some atrocious running times in two or three slides. So k is a constant. And just to be absolutely clear, uh, here's what the model means. So there are like some unknown sets of parameters, let's say mu i, sigma i, mean and covariance. And then you know you take Gaussian number one, you generate capital N over k iid points from the Gaussian with those parameters and call it cluster number one, C sub one. You similarly generate C sub two, C sub three, C sub K, take the union, delete the cluster labels, and you know, release the samples to the algorithm, okay? And you know, um, and of course the parameters are also unknown to the algorithm. The goal of the algorithm is to find a 99% accurate clustering of the data. Here's what that means. The algorithm's job is to come up with a way to group the capital N samples it sees into k equal size buckets so that each group overlaps with some true cluster in at least a 99% uh, you know, fraction of its points. Okay, that's the problem. So I'm sure some of you uh, are already thinking, well, you know, if two of the Gaussians happen to be very, very close to each other, let's say, you know, in the extreme case, have the exact same parameters, this is certainly going to be impossible. And indeed it is. And so what I'm gonna do is make an assumption that every pair of the Gaussians is well separated in a certain sense that I will soon describe to you, okay? So to describe this notion of well separation, um, there are like several options, right? Like I could choose any notion of distance between the parameters and say, well, you know, I'm gonna assume that uh, the Gaussians are pairwise separated in that distance. Instead, what I'm gonna do is, you know, state it in a way that is that makes it apparent that this notion of distance is the weakest possible notion, <clears throat> information theoretically speaking. And for that, I just need to define the total variation distance between two distributions to you. So I'm sure all of you have seen this before. If not, it is just up to a scaling of half, the L1 distance between you know, the density functions of the distributions. It's actually also helpful to think of this related parameter called as overlap between the two distributions, which is simply one minus the total variation distance. And both these quantities are always between zero and one. Okay, good. So uh, with that uh, definition, I can now state my precise notion of what it means for uh, uh, pairs of Gaussians to be well separated in total variation distance. I say that they are going to be well separated if the TV distance between them grows as one minus something that is much tinier than one over K, okay? In other words, the overlap between every pair of Gaussians is at most some very tiny constant times one over K, okay? Now it's legit to think why is it a reasonable thing to assume? So I want to justify that for just a second. So for this justification part, let's assume that I make the problem easier for you. Let's assume that you know I give the true parameters to you. I give you mu one sigma one, mu two sigma two, up to mu k sigma k. And I ask you to solve the same problem, okay? Now that you know the Gaussian distributions, can you cluster the points? And you know you can do various sensible things. Any reasonable thing that you will do looks like the following, okay? Let's take an example of an algorithm that you might try in this setting. You know, you have the Gaussians to under, under under you know, all the k possible Gaussians, you can compute the likelihood or the probability of seeing any point that is you know, inside your samples. 
And then you know you might want to just attach the sample to the Gaussian that gives it the maximum probability. Okay, this is just one thing you can do. You can do various variants of it. But what you can prove is that in any reasonable variant of this, the points that you will misclassify, the number of point, the fraction of point that will misclassify, equals um, the the sum of the overlaps of any cluster with all the remaining k minus one clusters. Okay. I'm going to just state that by fiat, not at all try to argue it. But in particular, that's the reason that I'm choosing the overlaps to be much smaller than one over k, because now the sum of the overlaps is going to be much tinier than some fixed constant, which means that it is reasonable information theoretically to ask to find a 99% accurate clustering. Okay, so that's that's the problem we are going to look at today. Good. So, okay, what about this problem? Well, there is this very nice and famous algorithm that came out about 10 years ago uh, due to Kalai Moitra Valiant, Moitra Valiant, and then Belkin and Senha, who gave a D to the polynomial in K algorithm to do parameter estimation. That's basically learn the parameters of a mixture of K Gaussian by exploiting certain polynomial relationships with that hold between moments of univariate Gaussians. Okay. In particular, you can actually use this algorithm to cluster. Uh, you know, uh, measures of Gaussians under certain regimes. But in fact, I'll argue to you in about 10 minutes or so that I, to the best of my understanding, there are clusterable measures of Gaussians that this algorithm actually cannot cluster. Regardless, you know, it kind of handles lots of interesting cases already. So it's a very interesting algorithm that solves, you know, um, you know, uh, many, many different kinds of clusterable measures of Gaussians. Um, uh, and so, you know, a natural question is, uh, what am I doing here? <laughs> Uh, this problem seems kind of almost solved. Um, and so the reason is that I'm actually looking at a variant of this problem today. I'm looking at a harsher variant, the so-called outlier robust variant of this problem. Here's what that means. The setting is the same. You know, somebody generates an IID sample from a mixture as I described earlier. But this time you don't get to see those samples. Instead, an adversary, you know, intercepts these samples and they get to change an arbitrary epsilon fraction of the samples by whatever they like. And of course, you know they're trying to make your life harder, so they'll they'll you know use adversarially worst case, uh, you know points to replace the epsilon fraction of the samples they want to work with. Okay, so this time you're given these yi's with the only guarantee that yi's intersect with some unknown true iid sample in one minus epsilon fraction, and your goal is still to cluster. But let's be a little bit more careful about what kind of guarantees we can expect. Okay, because an adversary can corrupt an epsilon fraction of the samples. One thing they can do is like you know force all this epsilon fraction of the outliers into one of the true clusters, and because the true cluster has weight one over k, these outliers constitute a k times epsilon fraction of the points in that cluster, which means that if I am sensibly asking for algorithm to do something reasonable, then you know I have to allow it to misclassify about k times epsilon fraction of the samples. So that's what would be our, that's what the goal would be. Okay, we would want to get a clustering which is accurate up to one minus you know k epsilon samples. We're going to work with epsilon much tinier than one over k. And as I convinced you earlier, we're going to think of it as a constant. So you know, no harm, no foul, so far. Good. So that's our goal. And so uh, you know, one thing you could immediately ask is, what about this algorithm I just showed you, which kind of works in many cases? Well, you know, I don't want to like mathematically justify it or anything, but because it exploits algebraic relationships between moments of Gaussians. It, which involves like solving some system of polynomial equations, it turns out that it's kind of hard to make this algorithm with some, you know, robust, like, with some modest modification into a robust algorithm. Okay. Um, and so that's the reason that, you know, uh, two years ago in another assignments program, Daiko Nicolas, Vampala, and Woodruff asked for, uh, you know, designing a outlier robust efficient algorithm for clustering, you know, this PV separated mixtures of K Gaussians. And so, you know, in this talk, basically what I'm telling you is a solution to that problem. Uh, it's a polynomial time algorithm to outlier robustly cluster all clusterable mixtures of K Gaussians. Um, the running time is atrocious. It's D to the K to the O of K, but you know, I prepared you for this moment. K is a constant, so this is a polynomial, all good. Uh, what I really like about this algorithm though, you know, it's great, you know, we, we solve some nice question, that's, that's fine. What I really like is that it's a truly new algorithm. What do I mean by that? Any algorithm has to come up with properties of the Gaussian distribution to exploit. And I told you before 
that this polynomial relationship based algorithm of Belkin Sinha, Kalai Mitravalliant, and Mitravalliant, it exploits you know, some relations between how the moments of univariate Gaussians are related to each other. Okay. And as I said, you know, it kind of looks hard to you know, make such an algorithm into a robust one. What we do here is come up with a new algorithm that exploits, instead of algebraic properties of this polynomial relationships form, Instead, it exploits analytic properties. In fact, it exploits two quite nice and uh, 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 simple analytic properties uh, called hypercontractivity and anti-concentration. Actually, it needs certifiable variants of it, which actually I realize I'm never going to get to in this talk. So sorry about that. Uh, but I'll explain to, this, to you what these properties mean, okay? So hypercontractivity is a certain statement about concentration uh, in the distribution. So in particular, what it means is that if you take any degree two polynomial of the Gaussian distribution, then the higher moments of it can be controlled, can be bounded in terms of you know, the second moment or powers of the second moment. So it's a certain concentration statement. The second statement is almost like an antithesis of it. It's an anti-concentrations requirement. What that means is that if you take the Gaussian distribution, project it into any direction, so take like a directional marginal of it, then the probability that this 1D distribution stays inside any small interval is small, okay? So again, I don't want to discuss the quantitative variance of it just now, but what we prove is that if you have any distribution that have this certifiable or algorithmic counterparts of these two concentration and anti-concentration properties, then in fact, you know, you can uh, cluster uh, uh, any mixture of them, okay? And so, uh, you know, uh, it's not like we can capture lots of uh, interesting distributions in this definition right now, unfortunately. I still like the fact that we can abstract out these two properties, but one mixture other than Gaussians that we can handle, if you were thinking about that, is, uh, you know, let's take, let's say you take uniform distribution on the sphere and take affine transforms of it, and then take mixtures of these affine transforms. Well, you know, in a black box way, the theorem I'm gonna state, I'm, I'm stating for you actually also yields an algorithm for clustering such mixtures, okay? Um, Anyway, so that, you know, that's, that's the result I'm going to talk about. And this result you know, uses the sum of squares method. But before I go further, I want to mention that you know, there is an independent work of Daiko Nicolas, uh, Sam Hopkins, who's around in this call, um, uh, Dan Kane, and uh, Sushrut Karmalkar, who also get a similar result for the special case of Gaussians. Uh, their algorithm is also uh, polynomial time, just like ours. OK, great. So that's the result I'm going to tell you a little bit more about today. Um, but you know, I have to include the mandatory motivation slides. Actually, I'm gonna you know skip through most of them, but I just wanna you know show you that they exist. So you know, uh, this slide tells you that this is an important problem. I'm sure uh, you know, and there is a mandatory picture of Carl Pearson in there, so I'm sure you're convinced. So let me not you know spend too much time on it. Actually, maybe I need to spend some time on justifying why I'm looking at robust algorithms. Uh, you know, uh, so let me you know do that. So, you know, robust estimation and like designing algorithms that are robust to various assumptions you make on data is of course like a very long, uh, you know, it ha has been a problem that has been studied for very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, a for a long time by statisticians mostly. And uh, efficient counterparts of this, you know, uh, were somehow, you know, uh, started getting looked at very seriously in this two, starting with these two very interesting papers that came out about five years ago. And this paper is of course, part of the same gravy train. Uh, it's like a whole, whole list of, you know, follow-up works, which I cannot list. Uh, on this one slide, so I'm not going to do. I'm not going to try, um, but you know, I don't want to justify uh, a robust estimation just by the intrinsic motivations of you know designing robust algorithms. Instead, I want to give you. Uh, I want to sketch an argument for you why you should care about this problem, even if you know you were just an algorithm designer who didn't care about so much about you know robust estimation. And the argument, you know, is that. You know, just like uh, any other measure of uh, uh, goodness of algorithms, like approximation ratios, running times, space complexity, whatever, outlier robustness is a property that inspires truly new algorithmic ideas, you know, which, which presumably as a theorist is all you care about. You know, what, what's the problem that forces you to think about new algorithms? And uh, actually, you know, beyond just that, it actually, you know, makes you come up with uh, insights that, uh, you, know, you know, otherwise would have been, you know, somewhat hard to come up with. And so a couple of them are listed on this slide. Again, I don't want to spend too much time. It's a short talk. I'm going to tell you about the result. But you know, the third part is kind of important in our context. You know, I told you earlier that there was this algorithm of Belkin Sinha, Kalai Moitravalliant, and Moitravalliant that uses algebraic structure to solve a similar problem in the non-outlier robust case. And the key to our result today is going to be, you know, come up with an algorithm that exploits analytic properties instead. And in fact, you know, uh, 
um, I won't get to tell you much about the algorithm, but here is one thing I can tell you. The entire paper, you know, like 90% of it is focused entirely on solving the non outlier robust problem. Because once you do that, the case of, you know, handling outliers becomes almost like an afterthought to it, like just some syntactic notational changes give you the outlier robustness. So that's in some sense, you know, in, in the argument that is sketched in the slide that, you know, somehow if you come up with the right algorithm, it will have this robustness properties, perhaps with only some tiny bit of modifications. And so, you know, if you're an algorithm designer, think of it as like one more constraint that you want to maintain, which helps you think about like new ideas for designing algorithms. Good, that's my uh, argument. That's my motivation anyway. So in the remaining part of this talk, which is like, I think 10 or nine minutes, uh, I will tell you something interesting. Uh, unfortunately, I tried very hard, but there's not gonna be any sum of squares in it. Uh, I'll include something in the last slide. Sorry about that. Instead, you know, I'll hopefully tell you some, some interesting, you know, pictorial facts, like geometry facts, which, you know, hopefully you enjoy. So what I wanna do in the first part of the talk is explain to you what does it mean for a pair of Gaussians to be separated in total variation distance? You know, I have, if I have to visualize it, I would like to somehow view it as some kind of distance between the parameters of the Gaussian. So I'll explain to you, you know, how you can think about this separation notion. And this will also allow me to, you know, point out cases where to the best of my understanding, I think the Moitra-Valiant and kalai moitra valiant algorithms do not work in the, for the clustering problem. I'll describe like one important case where it actually fails. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll pontificate for two minutes about uh, what we do new. Um, this would be rather understandable, but hopefully I'll convince you that this anti-concentration property that I mentioned before is relevant. And then, you know, uh, uh, I'll stop. And uh, if there are questions, I'll, you know, go into details of any of these things. Okay, that's my plan for today. Good. So let's see, you know, uh, how we can understand geometrically uh, the notion of two Gaussians being, you know, separated. So here's a fact, okay? Here's a fact that in fact, in, in, you, we, we prove in this paper. If two Gaussians, if two Gaussian distributions are separated in total variation distance in this weirdly parameterized way, so one minus exponential in minus delta square log delta for some parameter delta, and you know, permit me to have you know, this, this, this weird parameterization because it will make the statements that come next easier, to be easier. So two Gaussians are pairwise TV separated by, uh, you know, by, by this, by this one minus exponentially minus delta square log delta, if they are, if and only if they have separation that holds in one of the following three parameter distance ways, okay? The first is separation because of the means being far apart, okay? Here is what it means. And actually, let me explain the pictures I'm going to draw because uh, I think they're, they're kind of instructive. So I'm, I'm going to think of you know two dimensional uh, uh, two dimensional Gaussians. I'm going to you know draw ellipses for each of these Gaussians. The center of the ellipses denote the mean, and you know the the PSD matrices sigma i you know draw these uh, ellipses around it. So one way to think about it is that you know if you look at the extent of this ellipse, the distance of this any point of the ellipse, uh, you know to the center, then it tells you the variance of that Gaussian you know in that direction, okay in the in the two D space. Good. So here is what it means for two Gaussians to be mean separated. It means that there is a direction, let's say V, and V is the normal vector to this hyperplane that I'm drawing. Well, it's, it's a line here, but you know, imagine higher dimensional version in which case it could be hyperplane. It means that if there is, there is this direction V, so that if I project the distribution down into this direction and take the distance between the means in this direction, then it is multiplicatively larger than the sum of the variances of the two Gaussian in that direction. Okay, so the right-hand side is the sum of the variances of the two Gaussian, V transpose sigma i plus sigma j v. And this condition says that if I look at the mean distance in this direction, then it's like multiplicatively larger than the sum of the variances, okay? In fact, you know, this case is very well studied. The 20, like we wrote some papers about crossing measures of spherical Gaussians in 2018. And in some sense, that's the kind of separation that these papers handle. Okay, and perhaps like most of the attention so far has been focused on the mean separated case. Okay, so I won't spend too much time on it because I want to tell you two interesting other ways which you know are also uh, uh, you know what generate TV distance but are not really handled by previous works. And here is like you know uh, one cool notion. It's the spec. I, I call it the spectral separation. Here is what it means. In our two D di diagram that we've been drawing, imagine that the green and red Gaussians have the exact same means now. Okay. 
So their means are equal and their variances in the horizontal direction are also equal. But in the vertical direction, the red Gaussian has a multiplicatively higher variance than the green Gaussian, okay, by a factor of delta. Okay, it turns out that in that case, the Gaussians are also Stevie separated. Okay, now here is one extreme parameter regime of this notion of distance, which is very important for us. Imagine that one of the Gaussians here, in fact, has zero variance in the vertical direction. Let's say the green Gaussian has zero variance. Okay, its covariance is rank deficient. While the red Gaussian has non-zero but arbitrarily tiny variance in that same direction. This spectral separation notion is telling you that in that case, the two Gaussians are separated in a TV sense of one. So they're like maximally separated in TV distance. And the important thing is that this holds even though the red Gaussian's variance could be arbitrarily tiny non-zero number. Okay. In particular, notice that the parameter distance, like if you compute any possible norm of sigma minus sigma i minus sigma j, it's going to be, you know, arbitrarily tiny. And yet, in total variation distance, the two Gaussians are separated by one. Okay. So, one very nice case, one very nice example of such mixtures of Gaussians is the subspace clustering problem. Here is what the problem is if you've not heard about it. You are given a mixture of k Gaussians, each of them have mean zero. Each of, the, each of the covariances are basically projection matrices to distinct subspaces. As long as the subspaces are distinct, however close they might be to each other, as long as they're distinct, the pairwise TV separation between them is one. Notice that the parameter separation, any natural norm of the covariance difference is gonna be arbitrarily tiny, and yet they are TV separated by one. This is the case that to the best of my understanding, the kalai moitra and moitra papers do not handle because they give parameter distance guarantees. And in particular, I don't think that, you know, their algorithm can be used to cluster. That's what, you know, we are going to be able to solve today. Okay, so that's great. Uh, but, you know, I'm not done. There is a third way that two Gaussians can be separated in TV distance. The, two, the first two things, you know, were legit to draw in two dimensions because there are two dimensional Gaussians that can be TV separated in either mean way or the spectral way that I described. But this third notion is impossible to draw in 2D. This is a truly high dimensional way that two Gaussians can be TV separated. Here is what it means. And like, I implore you to ignore the formula that appears at the top, okay? Instead, focus only on the picture. Imagine that you have red Gaussian and green Gaussian, but this time they're in high dimension. So I'm only drawing like a projection in 2D now. And they basically have variances that differ slightly, let's say in every direction. But in any given direction, their variances are arbitrarily close. In fact, as you push D to infinity, the two Gaussians have essentially the same variance in every single direction. Yet, they are going to be TV separated as long as you know the separation in any single direction you know, is larger than this one over or like some big constant over root D. Okay, that's, that's all I'm gonna say here. And this is the relative Frobenius way of two Gaussians being pairwise TV separated. Okay. All right, so I just described to you three ways of being TV separated. Um, and so here is the fact I uh, started writing down earlier. Let me complete it now. The fact says that two Gaussians are TV separated. Then, you know, the following, one of the three possible ways of being uh, parameter separated must hold. The converse is actually easy to prove. So this is in some sense a hard direction. And in some sense, this fact is also not that hard to prove. It's completely elementary. We just, you know, work by passing on to the Hellinger distance and use the fact that there is like a close form formula for the Hellinger distance between any two Gaussians. Okay, so not gonna tell you this proof, but that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, the parameter way to understand TV separation. Uh, good, so let me, uh, 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 let me make this comment, you know, for the spherical case, as I said, you know, we only needed to handle the mean separation. That was basically what we did in 2018. Uh, the, the new things that we had to handle were really in the non-spherical case, was the spectral separation and the relative Frobenius separation. And actually it turns out, at least to me, the hardest case here is handling the spectral separation, which is some sense the, 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 the truly new piece here. Good. So as I promised to you in uh, the remaining, is there, is there time remaining? I guess I have one minute. Well, you know, you, you can take a two or three minutes to finish. Okay, yeah, so yeah, this is the pontificating part. So I'm not gonna tell you anything great. I just point out one, uh, you know, cool point, okay? So uh, for the mean separated case, it turns out, 
So, you know, any, any algorithm, let me make this following comment, like any algorithm that, you know, solves a clustering problem for some distribution has to come up with some properties of that distribution to exploit. Like somehow, you know, you, you have to find a way to separate true clusters from fake clusters. So you must check some property of which holds for true clusters, let's say Gaussian clusters, which does not hold, you know, if you, you know, if you take fake clusters, you must come up with some property. In the mean separated case that we handled in 2018, this property turned out to be sub-Gaussian directional moments. The fact that, you know, if I project the distribution into any single direction and compute higher moments, they can be upper bounded in terms of the lower moments, okay? It turns out that for the two other kinds of separation that I just showed you, this moment upper bound is provably not enough, okay? In fact, in the longer talk, I give you a very simple example which demonstrates this. I will not give you this example today, but it turns out that one key method that allows us to handle this case algorithmically is to come up with this way to you know, exploit anti-concentration algorithmically. And thankfully, you know, in this uh, previous sequence of works, uh, 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 we were able to develop this idea of certifiable anti-concentration, uh, which somehow turns out to be the key piece in you know, handling spectral separated uh, Gaussians. So anyway, like I, all I want to say is that, you know, moment upper bounds are not enough. You have to come up with some ways to, you know, exploit uh, moment lower bounds. And this anti-concentration property of Gaussians is somehow crucial there. In fact, not just crucial, but necessary. All right, so that's all I want to say. Um, I've never, not, not told you at all about what this algorithm is, but it's, you know, the sum of squares algorithm. I'm sure you know of it. Um, you know, in, in my previous talks, I, all I used to say is like these steps one, two, three. Uh, but it turns out that in this particular uh, work, uh, all the steps were kind of non-trivial. So let me not somehow say that uh, steps two and three are easy. Instead, let me just point you to, you know, sources for learning more about this. So uh, we wrote this monograph uh, last year, which you can, you know, uh, check out. There, in fact, we, uh, you know, include an exposition for the spherical mixture case. Um, and, you know, if you're so interested in learning more about this method in detail, then I'm actually teaching a class right now, Fall 20, and it's completely online, and you can ask me for a Zoom link to it. Good. All right. That's all I want to say. There are cool open questions, which I will leave it on the slide. Thank you very much, Pranesh. So there, <clears throat> there are a couple of questions in the queue. I'm first going to unmute Andres Carrada, uh, who asked a question or two in the Q&A. Ah, OK. Andres? Hi, yes. So. Uh, so I'm struck by the algebraic similarity between. Uh, so first of all, what I'm what I'm comparing is your talk is about clustering. So I'm not talking about clustering. I'm talking. I'm going back to my, uh, you know, also the ground truth inference problem, right? Which is given that you now have n noisy teachers, which are you know, uh, you know, you know, spiky Gaussians, right? Uh, about the ground truth, could you recover? their error covariance so that then you can, you know, recombine them and get back the, the ground truth, right? So that's the problem. And of course, the only way to do this non-parametrically without knowing anything about the distributions is to use moments of the data that you're given. And those are al the algebraic relations, right? right? And, and so that, that allows the problem to be solved. So that's, that, that's what I'm, I, I mean there. And so, but I'm really interested because the, the algebraic problem then has, can only be solved, it, it's always short, right? The, the algebraic relationships cannot tell you everything and they tend to be n short. So when uh, the problem goes, when the noisy sources of ground truth are not sparsely correlated, you start not being able to solve it. So I'm really interested in your not, uh, analytic approach so I, I really like that references you gave uh, at, at the end, and I'm going to read those. Thank you. I'll, I'll Great, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry for like giving you essentially an information free talk, like it's all, all buzzwords, no information. But you know, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to, you know, um, point you to videos for like longer talks that I gave on this. And I, yeah, uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, any of the sources or any of the questions you might have, I'll be very happy to, you know, uh, you know, exchange emails and uh, uh, clarify. Uh, thanks so much for the interest. <laughs> Um, Sam, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Although uh, somebody has been clarifying it to me offline, but others might have the same question, um, which is, in, Pravesh, can you give some example in the case where Moitra Valiant can't do clustering um, of a set of parameters that they would be allowed to return, but where 
you wouldn't be able to use those parameters to do clustering trivially because I thought that they give guarantees in in total variation distance. So uh, to the best of my understanding, their guarantees are in uh, parameter distance. What that means uh, is that um, you know uh, you know they can give you some arbitrarily like you know there is some parameter epsilon let's say, and then they can give you estimates of the mean which are accurate to L two distance within let's say epsilon, and uh, estimates of uh, covariances which are accurate to you know uh, Frobenius distance of epsilon, and when you know you have bounds on uh, let's say uh, when you have bounds on um, Okay, let's, let's put it this way. You know, suppose, uh, so, so let, let's take an example, right? Let's say that I give you a measure of two Gaussians. Um, they have, uh, you know, zero means and uh, their covariances are projections to subspaces. Now imagine that the subspaces are same dimensions and they're like basically tiny perturbations of each other. Yeah, okay? the, which means the TV that distance is one. Their TV distance is one. And in some sense, you know, the way uh, we would exhibit this TV distance is by showing a direction in which, you know, one of the Gaussians, you know, basically has zero variance while the other one will have like a non-zero variance. But the point is that, you know, the parameter distance between these two Gaussians is, you know, arbitrarily tiny, which means that if all you give me is an estimate of the covariance, which is accurate to within epsilon in Frobenius distance, that's not going to distinguish, that's not going to allow me to, you know, uh, uh, distinguish between points from these two uh, subspace Gaussians. So a natural idea that like in their paper is to so-called isotropize the Gaussians. Like you know, compute the covariance of the mixture and then you know put the mixture in the isotropic position. In that view, what fails, in my opinion, is if you look at the new covariances, they will have you know some eigenvalues which will be very very tiny and some eigenvalues will be very very large. And the point is that a fixed uh, parameter distance of epsilon will not be enough to recover the tiny eigenvalues in you know the relevant notion of distance. So maybe those are the two ways to understand why parameter distance approaches will not be able to cluster, you know, these arbitrarily close subspace examples. Thanks. Yeah, let, let, let me give a shout out to Ainish who has been clarifying this to me offline uh, and, and explain yeah, this it, very nicely. It, it also took us uh, a while to figure this out, uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, glad it makes sense now. <laughs> um, so Rahesh, if I could ask something. Yes. Um, so. I mean, the, the sort of uh, approaches by uh, Moitra Valiant and others that you point to, these are like method of moments type approaches, right? These have yes. a very long history in statistics. Yes. Um, I, to my understanding, one reason why people love them is because they often perform well, at least in low dimensions, even if you are a bit far away from distributional assumptions, right? So you mm -hmm. don't really need normality for everything to work. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, the approach that you sort of were suggesting of actually exploiting distributional properties is that really sort of robust in that in high dimensions, if you have distributions which are not mixtures of Gaussians, but distributions that are close to Gaussians, would you still expect your approach to work? Um, uh, I, I, I want to say the answer is yes. And in fact, OK, some of the robustness is always in the eye of the beholder. But uh, you know, uh, I think in a precise sense, this approach, I would say, is more robust. And so the reason I would say that is the following. So um, you know, actually, you know, so let me make one point clear before even going ahead. Our algorithm in the end is also exploiting properties that can be derived from moments. But I guess the point we are making is that you don't need equality of moments or you don't need sure. you know, satisfying this moment relationships you know, uh, uh, up to this polynomial exactly. relationship that are true. In fact, right. we are saying that you know, we only need the moments up to the fact that they imply these two nice analytic properties. So one is the hypercontractivity property of degree two polynomials and the other is the anti-concentration property. In particular, if you perturb the moments, they will continue to satisfy these properties. In fact, I'm, I, I'm going to say that you, know, you can design very natural perturbations which will kill the polynomial relationship between you know, sure, sure, moments. Sure. I, I guess I'm wondering how, how robust the anti-concentration and the hypercontractive properties are. Right? These are usually things that we hear about in the context of Gaussian distributions. right? Right. And so, uh, OK, so the, the other way I can potentially answer that question is by giving you other distributions that the same algorithm works for. I guess when I gave you one example early on, which right. is you know affine transforms of uniform distribution on the sphere, you could come up with other examples. I mean, there are certainly many more examples of distributions which are hypercontractive and anti-concentrated. Unfortunately, our algorithm doesn't work because we need certifiable counterparts. Yeah. And in some sense, yeah, for those, we only have this limited set of examples. But, but also notice that if you get, if you, if you get samples from a distribution, which is only epsilon or, you know, 
one minus epsilon close in total variation to an actual mixture of Gaussians, the whole point of Prevesh's algorithm is it will work, right? right because yeah. any TV perturbation is okay as long as you make, uh, as long as the TV distance is one over K. You know, like you don't have to think of them as outliers is Sam's point. You know, you could think of them as a mixture of uh, distributions, each of which is like one minus one over K square close in TV distance to Gaussians, but no other guarantees. So perturbations in TV distance are okay is the message. Are okay for the individual distributions. Yes. Right. So, so Pravesh, your your lemma about the these three alternatives for uh, two Gaussians that have variation distance, it seems like the uh, one way to state that is that anytime two Gaussians have a, a noticeable variation distance, there is a separator which is either a hyperplane or a pair of hyperplanes that are parallel, or an ellipsoid whose shape is given by one of the two. Is that is that another way to put it so that you have these algorithmically derivable separators from the parameters? Yes, absolutely. Yes. In fact, you know, uh, uh, one, one alternate method that I think, one alternate way that people have uh, stated this, or uh, maybe like Sam's paper states this, is um, that if two Gaussians are separated in variation distance, then either there is a linear polynomial that's somehow noticeably different on the two distributions, or there is a quadratic polynomial that is noticeably different in the two. Uh, distributions. So the quadratic polynomial is of two forms, just to remind you. Uh, one of them comes from the spectral separation, in which case the quadratic polynomial looks like square of a linear form. And um, uh, in the third way, the relative Frobenius way, the, the polynomial is like truly high rank, like, you know, it, it's uh, the, the coefficient matrix is going to be truly high rank, if that makes sense. But yes, yes, you can, you can characterize these three notions of distance in that way. Okay. Um so there are a couple other questions from Andres, but I think maybe they could be taken offline so that we can have a 120 second break before Sam's talk. Um, but <laughs> yes. thank you very much again, Pravesh. Thank you.